Good evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Dennis Mason. You're watching the continuing series of Friday webcasts featuring Mr. LaRouche. Uh, tonight we'll follow the usual format. We'll have an opening statement by Lynn and then a question period. The questions tonight will be conducted by Leandra Bernstein and Jason Ross. So without any further delay, I'm proud to bring you Mr. Lynn and LaRouche. Well, there was some very interesting news that were given to me today earlier, and that is that I never have seen in my life such a parade of implicit indictments of a President of the United States as was reported to me today. I'm not going to comment on the details of these, this report, but I simply say that it comes as a blessed sign from heaven or something of that like that, and uh, we should be greeted as such. It's obvious that, what is obvious, without going into the details, which will are better stated by relevant legal authorities and judicial authorities than by me, but I can say that what I've heard today, and I do understand what I've heard, yeah, that this is probably the greatest indictment of an incumbent president of the United States that I've ever heard. If there's one that occurred um, less uh, ominous than this one, I don't know what it was. And I think I know the history of the United States pretty well. But that comes uh, not as a finality of anything, because this situation is, is subject to all kinds of reversals back and forth. But the fact that th such a counter to the president's behavior has been stated publicly by a federal court is in itself a very important development, even without trying to interpret what has been said. But the implications are, as any plain language view would say, this man has been slapped down back and forward repeatedly through the whole uh, reading of these charges. Now that does mean there's a, a qualitative shift in the political situation inside the United States, which the reading of these charges, um, uh, conclusions, I presume, uh, have been delivered. I don't think any president could uh, withstand what has been read against them with such precision in the history of the United States. Some people have maybe hated someone more than they hate this fellow, but they certainly have put place the charges, and I don't think that without, without the equivalent of some kind of coup d'etat in behave on in support of the president that he can withstand this it's it these if these charges are uh, presented and concluded and if the consequences follow this man is probably on the way out of office barely since the time he was reinstalled in it so that's probably a double whammy in this case but the what this does show with conclusion which i can speak to on that account is that after these charges have been placed and reported by the federal court that this president is in deep trouble and that much is clear now what it means for the rest of us is that the, the situation was so bad in terms of the congress that the congress should have delivered precisely these kinds of charges beforehand and pr undoubtedly, there were people inside the Congress, the Senate and House, particularly, particularly the Senate, who would have proceeded on these charges if encouraged to do so. And I think that has to be considered a factor, that the, all the ideas that somehow Obama has come off clean on the basis of his reinstallation as president, that that, that is in doubt now. There's no, I don't believe that any president, unless he has the powers to conduct a coup d'etat, could may remain in office under the continuation of the list of charges which have been presented as conclusions by the federal court. So this is a new situation, and it means also a new situation for us in terms of things like troubles as much as anything we might find pleasant in this whole proceeding. The United States is in deep trouble. Our economy is in the process of disintegrating. The, we are about the point that an actual breakdown, it, 
of the uh, Congress could occur, of the end of the courts. And therefore, Bernanke, what's going to happen to Bernanke? The courts are against him. And probably that will be effective. It's not guaranteed, but it probably will be effective. And the citizens of the United States are going to have to wake up. And, and they, I, that's, that's quite possible that they will. Uh, because the usual way that people talk about presidential institutions, Congress, and so forth, is, is nonsense. There actually has been usually not more than 5% of the voting population which has had the guts to do anything serious, actually do it. Many, many members of the Congress, for example, will gripe privately behind the scenes, but they won't do anything. And generally it's between 5 and 10% of the total membership of the Congress, which is likely to take on an issue such as this one. Perhaps the implication is, and I say perhaps, is that the presentation of these charges, these brought by the court, uh, will give some courage to a lot of people who are otherwise scampers as cowardly uh, heroes, shall we say, before. But the point is, on the other hand, you take the British monarchy and certain elements of the U.S. government and the population, and they are going to fight back. They're going to fight back hard. And they would even try coup d'etats and things like that, or things of that nature. So we must be aware of the fact that there is, without doubt, apart from what the federal court has decided on the, on the case of Obama, is that there is going to be a big kickback from forces in certain parts of Europe. The British monarchy in particular will be enraged by this. Other parts in, in France will be enraged. Some people in Germany will be enraged. You will have a certain factor of rage from the bad side in Italy. You will have also the anger of, in Spain and Portugal and other places. This means a, a sudden turn in the uh, strategic situation and role of Russia in this period. All these things have been made open by this decision, the rendering of this decision by the federal court. And this is something new which did not exist for me two days ago, and it probably did not exist for a lot of other people. But it shows that in the system, the federal courts have acted, the federal court has acted in a way which portends the opportunity for getting out of the mess we've been digging into for so long. This is a new opportunity, and it's a time for the citizens of the United States to rally to the cause of our nation and prepare to support the actions of the federal court. And with that, I will leave it to you for a moment. Well, thank you for those opening remarks. Uh, you've anticipated uh, a number of our questions here, but I would like to get some more clarity because of the importance of uh, what what has taken place. And I'm going to hold. We're going to hold the question on uh, on the recent the recent ruling uh, until our until Jason Ross asks it. But I, I would like to get you on the record here in response to what took place earlier this week with the Senate and House Foreign Relation Committee hearings uh, featuring Hillary Clinton, outgoing Secretary of State Clinton. And uh, you initially, uh, your initial remarks on it uh, were to call the hearings a perfunctory performance, irrelevance to the facts of the case, uh, you said there was no discussion of the crucial facts of relevance, and you indicated that the members of Congress were told to shut up, that what they intended to raise as questions they never asked. Now that is given uh, certain knowledge that we had in, uh, in the organizing that the LaRouche Political Action Committee has been doing on Capitol Hill, and also an indication given by Hillary Clinton herself that the day of 
uh, excuse me, the day the day of or the day prior to the hearings, uh, the FBI had decided to take the opportunity to finally brief these committees. So, so uh, just to go through some of the highlights of these hearings, uh, the most notable was Hillary Clinton's in enraged response to a series of questions coming from Republican Senator Ron Johnson from Wisconsin saying who who insisted you have deceived the uh, not you but the American people have been deceived uh, as to the facts around the second 9-11 attack and she responded saying what difference does it make we're dealing with four dead Americans. What difference does it make whether they were killed by somebody walking down the street who decided to kill Americans? And then this, and then, uh, this statement was then backed up by Obama's press secretary, Jay Carney, the following day in a press conference, first question at the press conference, where he basically said uh, Secretary Clinton was correct. What difference does it make? What difference does it make if the president of the United States deceives the American people? So, uh, and then the and then the statement of of intention. What difference does it make that as so long as we bring those who were responsible for the act to justice? And uh, it was interesting because just recently after the. Uh, the hostage taking in Algeria, there are a number of press reports, one from the New York Times uh, referring to a senior Algerian official who said that uh, the individuals who laid siege to the Algerian gas complex had also taken part in the deadly attack on the United States mission in Libya in September. And then another report from the, uh, the Tripoli Post, which was entitled, Terrorists Who Attacked Algerian Gas Complex May Have Been Trained in Libya. So, as long as those who are responsible for the attack are brought to justice. So, since we have you in this, in this format, I would like to get you on the record uh, your your response to what took place this week with the hearings and the overall situation. Well, clearly, in fact, uh, what Hillary Clinton said was entirely untrue. Simple fact. Now, the in, the other side of that is the speculation on why she said what she said. For about two years. I have watched a fundamental change in attitude respecting the president by Hillary Clinton. In other words, half of her term, approximately, has been under, under conditions which can be explained by the fact that she was terrified. That she confronted him, she changed her attitude on this after this occasion. She after that point she was to humiliated in every sense of the word by Obama. And she caved in. And her husband, the former president, caved in massively. Which means that there was something very ugly, very, very, very ugly about the presidency of Obama after the midterm of his first term. So that's the first thing to take into account. So therefore, she was, I would conclude that she was terrified. Because such a sudden change in behavior on her part, considering that her husband has been, had been a two-term president of the United States, that this man would, would dare to attempt to intimidate her, and he did intimidate her. There's no question of that. So th this, of course, is in, must be in the mind of po people like members of the Supreme Court who must be aware of this gross and so obviously gross monstrosity is that behavior by him. 
And the question then posed, well, what's wrong with the Congress? Well, we know what's wrong with the Congress, that more than half of them are, are cowards and opportunists. And therefore, it, the Congress was not able to do the job that had to be done. And under those conditions, it was up to the Supreme Court to see to it that the job was done, or the basis for having the job done was presented by a, a higher authority. And the particular list of things that I've heard all go to that point. So we now, we're now presented because higher authorities have realized, as I have, that this President Obama um, is a horror. He's a horror story. And the, the members of the Congress didn't have the collective guts to do anything about it. They've swallowed every indecency imposed upon them as, as a Congress, both in the Senate and in the House. Some, now, we know that, as I know, for example, you have between 5 and 15 percent, probably, approximately, of the members of the Congress have the guts to do anything. And therefore, the fact that the majority of members of the Congress are, by in disposition, uh, they tend to be opportunists. They see which way the wind blows, and they blow with it. Uh, so that, therefore, it was a, we had reached a situation in which the United States was going to be destroyed by this president. And he was even sworn in for a second time. term. But the fact remains, as with the Nixon case, that this is the uh, extreme version of the old Nixon case, the old Nixon impeachment. But in this case, some authority other than the Congress was required to initiate the action which was required. And what I heard from the reading of the conditions of the charges, of the conclusions of the court, those conclusions were all in correspondence to the requirements. And I go into the, his first term, the president's first term in office, as also to the second. So there was, there was every reason, uh, uh, that reason would demand, that this president should be impeached under those circumstances. The impeachment as a form has not been realized. The impeachment in terms of the indictment has. And that's the conclusion we have to draw. Now that does not mean, now you, you're going to have the British Empire, as represented by the Queen, is going to be very angry about this because her whole role, her intention it is on the, on the edge. She, ca she cannot continue to do this if the United States continues to defy her, defy her. And the federal courts have implicitly defied her. Something deeper inside our system of government has acted to attempt to defend the United States against the travesties and crimes committed by this president. And uh, therefore, I think that's the conclusion to be drawn. We now stand at a point we're on the edge. The court has done pretty much what it should have done, and maybe a bit more in this case. That's good. That restores our confidence in the institutions of our government, contrary to this president. And the, the, the very minimum, the intention of the court has to be rec to recognize that it, what, it, what it has said is an honest and fair conclusion, set of conclusions. And these conclusions lead to but one further conclusion, that this guy must be impeached now. And that will probably occur. But there are other factors in the thing. There are always coup d'etat possibilities and things like that. So we don't know this has any finality to it. But it comes so damn close to it that you almost have it say it is. All right. Well. It's a happy duty to get to report and ask you a question about what the uh, the court's ruling was. 
Let me start by reading part of Article 2, Section 2 of a very important document, the Constitution. This is about the, what the President does. It says, He shall have the power, by and with the advice and consent of Senate, to make treaties, provided two-thirds of the Senators present concur, and he shall nominate, and, by and with the advice and consent of the Senate, shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers of the United States. The President shall have the power to fill up all vacancies that may happen during the recess of the Senate by granting commissions which shall expire at the end of their next session. So today, the, uh, he said this is almost like a gift of, from heaven, and you might think that the U.S. District Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C. is an unlikely source for a gift from heaven, but that's how it happened this time. Uh, they had a 47-page ruling that came out today around a lawsuit that originally came from uh, the operation of the National Labor Relations Board, which has a, a five-person board, and one of the rulings it made was being challenged because three members of the board the majority, had been appointed as recess appointments by Obama on January 4th, um, when the Senate wasn't actually in recess. The, I want to read you some quotes from this, from this uh, court ruling, because it's very important. They admit that, they, they note that their ruling is very important. They say, while the posture of the petition is routine, as it developed, our review is not they point out that what Obama is doing is extending the power of the executive branch far beyond what is allowed in the Constitution, and that this is oppressive to the rights of not just the legislature, but the American people. They rejected uh, Obama's Office of Legal Counsel, which said that, quote, the president has the discretion to conclude that the Senate is unavailable to perform its advise and consent function, and to exercise his power to make recess appointments. The court said, no, the president doesn't get to decide when the Senate's in recess. The Senate does. If the president can decide, then when they leave for the weekend or when they go to lunch, he could say, well, they're in recess, they're unavailable, I'm going to appoint, you know, five new uh, members of the cabinet. So, very importantly, they refer back to Marbury versus Madison, which established the precedent of judicial review, that although obviously the Constitution applies to all branches of government, it is the courts that determine the meaning of that document. That's their job. They wrote that, um, while we recognize that all branches of government must, of necessity, exercise their understanding of the Constitution in order to perform their duties faithfully thereto, Ultimately, it is our role to discern the authoritative meaning of the supreme law. A little bit more. They said that Obama, <clears throat> Obama, the administration's claim that if they had to wait for the confirmations, it would have made the government less efficient. They said, well, too bad. The, the uh, convenience and efficiency are not the primary objectives or the hallmark of our government. So it's a, very, it's a very stinging rebuke. They point out that the recess of the Senate means the recess, when they really go home, not when they're gone for a few days. So as you said, that this is an, an impeachment implicitly. Uh, it's not a conviction yet. That's up to the Senate. But what's laid out in, this, in, the, uh, in the court ruling very aggressively makes the case that Obama has violated the Constitution blatantly in this action of his. So I, uh, I mean, you've already said a lot about this in your opening, but um, I guess I'd like to ask you to comment further and then talk about wh wh where does this go now? What, is, what does this open up for us? Well, if you take the whole thing, I, I had heard that specifically before, earlier today. Uh, but the key thing here is what has been said by the court as statements as a whole, not only this issue but other issues <laughs> also, uh, is a challenge to the presidency is a challenge to the occupation of the presidency by this this president because he is the one who has taken the open responsibility for asserting this authority above the courts and therefore his every action is impeachable by nature that much I can will say is a is for what I am uh, I will let the court say what it wants to say about this but that's what I say as a citizen uh, that this is the situation. 
Now, I also say, base my judgment on my knowledge of the crimes which have committed by this president, been committed by this president. He's a criminal, as far as I'm concerned. He's said things and done things which are criminal in their nature. He's also practiced intimidation, which is in his nature, but not in the nature of our government. There's nothing that he has done of this nature of trying to, uh, his going, for example, his violation of the war, war powers of the president, his violation of the restrictions on those war powers. First of all, he was not entitled to put troops into action in Libya. Hmm? Not entitled to do that. It's a violation. And to go into armed conflict in Libya is a violation of the Constitution. He had no authorization to do that. He acted as a dictator. And that's a violation of our Constitution. Now, we act the fact that our Congress was cowardly and didn't do anything about it, huh? and that one senator got by with, with supporting this crime by this of this president, huh? doesn't alleviate the responsibility of anyone. They, you know, the president should have been impeached for doing that. That was an impeachable offense. He should be impeached. Otherwise, the politer term, com, uh, common to most people's knowledge, is he should have been thrown out of office promptly and immediately on the first time he did that. He should have been slapped in the face first, and if he continued, he should have been slapped down out of off, slapped out of office. It's the obvious fact. So the problem here is, is, a, is a fact of a cowardice shown by the Congress. The Congress permitted or to one senator, permitted a violation of the, of the Constitution in terms of the uh, War Powers Act. Hmm? And therefore, that senator should have been impeached too, because he was complicit in a violation of the Constitution. He's not fit to be appointed to, what, to a more significant position. Maybe a rebuke or an official rebuke for what he had done would be sufficient. But he should not be promoted to an office with higher powers than he's enjoyed heretofore. This, this is the kind of the nature of the situation. And fortunately, the courts existed. The federal court exists. And the federal court, with a series of actual indictments of this president, and there are a series of them, as you know, this man is no longer longer fit to be office. Uh, Nixon was a mild offender compared to this, pr this president, and on these charges alone to, to certify him. The problem is somebody's going to try to reverse this on some kind of appeal. On the case of the Hillary case, you know, just, it's just the same problem. She's intimidated. She was abused. Intimidated, that much I know. Her husband was thrown into a tizzy a former president, thrown into a tizzy by what his wife had gone through, made terrible decisions in terms of mistakes, which are terrible decisions on his part. But his wife was in danger, in danger from this president. And on the basis of one moment in her record as uh, in the state, you know, in the state, that that, that was a case, visibly, of pure intimidation. And the President of the United States, I mean, she should have resigned. Actually, her decision, only option, was to resign the office. And then go out, go back into the, to the Senate, body of the Senate, and run a campaign against this President. That was her moral duty. It was a mistake for anyone to push her into taking that position under that President. Because they shared, at least Bill did, Bill Clinton shared what I, the knowledge of what my view was, that she should not have capitulated to taking the position, considering the monstrous nature of the character of this person, this president. She should have gone outside and said what she said and denounced him up and down, because she had been the, the only legitimate presidential candidate on the Democratic side. The only, uh, he was not. And she should have stayed, at, gone outside, and moved back and avoided, rejected that in the first place, and stayed in the Senate. That's what she should have done. She had colleagues when she was a senator in the Senate who could fight this issue better 
than she could from inside the position she took. Of, of, um, so that's the kind of situation we face. So that's the way we have to react to this. And we have to react to this. We all have our, especially for someone in my position, I'm supposed to have guts to deal with things like this. And I always will, as long as I'm alive. I have a lot of experience with this sort of thing, with the history of our nation. And I, I would back up anyone, including her, Bill, on this issue. She should not have ever been appointed president. I do not consider him honestly elected as president on the basis of what I know. Foreign powers were using the proceeds of drug, drug distributions, illicit drug distribution, in order to finance him to become the president of the United States. I would say this man himself is now purely a drug on the market, and he should be removed from office immediately. Because we, I know, I know as per, on personal knowledge where this per, present situation is going under this president. And anyone who's a true patriot with the guts and knowledge to be a patriot would support me in saying he must be thrown out of office now. <laughs> Now, I would like to follow up Jason's question with, uh, with another potential gift from, <laughs> uh, from the D.C. Circuit, uh, D.C. Circuit Court. And that is coming at the beginning of February, February 7th, where there's going to be a hearing in the uh, lower, uh, in a lower court in the D.C. Circuit uh, to hear the Department of Justice's motion to dismiss the case by the House of Representatives uh, against the, the stonewalling by the Justice Department, Eric Holder's Justice Department, on uh, revealing facts on the Fast and Furious case. Um, so, I, I mean, that's, that's something that's, that's also in the background of this, of this decision. And it's very interesting that this is going to be this case is going to be heard. The use of executive privilege uh, announced by the Obama administration through Eric Holder to withhold evidence uh, subpoenaed by the House of Representatives. Uh, there is some discussion that this is also at the root of the sudden announced resignation of the Deputy Attorney General Lanny Brewer, who just uh, in the past 24 hours, I believe it was, announced that he was going to be leaving the Justice Department. And he's someone who has been implicated in the cover-up of the Fast and Furious documents. And he is also, uh, he's also the subject of a recently released PBS Frontline special titled The Untouchables, uh, which, which, documents, which documents the failure of the United States government, of leading, leading officials to prosecute any of the guilty parties, uh, provably guilty of fraud, massive fraud, in the financial crisis of, of 2008 and on, but especially 2010 and onward post uh, after the the Angelides Commission report and I th I think it's just it's interesting because at, at a certain point in this documentary uh, the interviewer for uh, for Frontline asks uh, asks Brewer uh, you gave a speech before the New York Bar Association talking about your use of non-prosecution and deferred prosecution agreements uh, so the you know, the slap on the wrist. Uh, and in that speech, you made a reference to losing sleep at night over worrying about what a lawsuit might result in at a large financial institution. Is that really the job of a prosecutor? 
to worry about anything other than simply pursuing justice. And the, uh, the Deputy Attorney General, Lanny Brewer, responded uh, that if I bring a case against Institution A, and as a result of bringing that case, there's some huge economic effect, it affects the economy so that employees who had nothing to do with the wrongdoing of the company are affected. If it creates a ripple effect so that suddenly counterparties and other financial institutions or other companies that had nothing to do with it uh, are affected badly, it's a factor we need to understand. Now, this, this is also uh, being released in the wake of the, the $1.9 billion slap on the wrist uh, about a, a little over a month ago to HSBC, who, was in, if there were any kind of honest investigation, they were uh, culpable of massive fraud, massive money laundering, Ho the most horrendous money laundering imaginable and it was and it was uh the delivery of the it was uh lanny brewer who uh announced this 1.9 billion dollar fine so i i mean i just wanted to point this out in background as as a continuation off of your previous question but to really get to the point um a lot of a number of institutional contacts have uh, been dying to ask you the question over the past week uh, weeks of development around the push to instate reinstate Glass Steagall. So, uh, if you could if you could address uh, this situation as well as uh, the recent statements in support of Glass Steagall, please do gladly. The key issue here of the Obama administration, the crucial issue, apart from his violations of the law and his intent to violate the law, is as in uh, the War Powers Act and things of that sort, is the fact that the U.S. economy is about to disintegrate. One of the factors in this action by the federal courts is the fact that the United States government is hopelessly bankrupt. There's no possibility of a survival of the U.S. government under a continuation of this presidency because the rate of hyperinflation now is such that we're on the brink of a transatlantic general breakdown crisis of the entire world system. As long as this Bernanke idiot is in a powered position to continue what he's done with the backing of Obama, there's no likelihood of the survival of the United States as a nation. So therefore, that you have a concrete crime which is very specific to the question of the survival or collapse of this nation. And the collapse of this nation in that form would mean mass death among the population of the United States, as we see already in the food supply question. And the measures of the, of, of, by this administration, which will increase the death rate massively, as in the farm district and elsewhere in the United States. So the ouster of this president is itself a cause for removal of the president, of the urgent removal of this president. Now we have in this connection, we have ob observations from sections of the federal courts at the, the, and the federal agencies which are concerned with this matter. And you have leading, leading members of the, depart, of the department um, uh, who actually share that and have expressed that share, that concern. It's necessary to shut down Bernanke. Now, there's only one successful way you can do that. You can shut down Bernanke. That's one act, but you've got to do more than that. What you've got to do is essentially put through Glass-Steagall immediately. And the existence of the United States as a nation now depends, among other things, but specifically, one thing. You must get bon shut down Bernanke. And you must have, at the same time, you must install Glass-Steagall. 
Now, Glass-Steagall means three principal things. Number one, you must do it. You must enact the law. That's a law. Uh, you must also, uh, in that sense, you, you must el eliminate that thing. You must put Glass-Steagall into, into practice immediately without any change from what the proposed act is now. No modifications, no going around maneuvering things, no compromises. Slam it down now. And put Glass-Steagall, as proposed, into action immediately. That will, will stop the crisis in one sense, but that's not enough. You also have to establish a credit system. We haven't seen one of those for a long time. But we need a credit system under which the federal government is, gains the power to create an institution which is a credit institution uh, which gives credit for things which are warranted under that policy. In other words, going back to a credit system a, of the type which was existed under the first presidency of the United States. For this first and second term of the United States on the first president, under the first president of Washington, set up a credit system. That, cre that credit system was then taken down by the successor presidents. Huh? It has to be restored. Under a credit system, the United States were organized with backing of the federal government on credit for useful projects which will rebuild the U.S. economy. In other words, we put into effect Glass-Steagall. That means the federal government no longer owes any money on that kind of banking system which has ruined us. Those, those banks are put on their own. Those private banks are on their own. If they can survive on their own, they can survive. If they cannot survive on their own, we are going to be rid of them and of the, a lot of people and a lot of debts. So we're going to cut the debt of the United States from its present form down to a minimal, its new form. Instead, we're going to develop, since we cannot increase production much, simply by, by, by Glass-Steagall, you have to do something else under Glass-Steagall. You have to create a credit system authority in which federal credit is used to finance uh, promissory notes uh, for large-scale investments over fixed terms of, of, of time. Was it maybe one year for this kind of help? It may be five years for that. It may be Glass-Steagall uh, comes in and is used for a NOAPA project. The NOAPA project would be at least 20 to 25 years duration. And believe me, that would really change the direction of the United States in, in people, and the conditions of the people of the United States. And there are other things that can be done as well, um, in addition to that. So these, these measures, which can be taken under a revision, could mean an immediate turnabout in direction. Now, we have lost a lot of skills in the United States over these years because of this, this especially since the cancellation of Glass-Steagall. We have lost tremendously. We're almost bankrupted as a result of the cancellation of Glass-Steagall. So that's, that becomes the issue. Now you have the same thing is true in, in Europe. Europe cannot function. Continental Europe is about to break down, to disintegrate. So these are the, these are the kinds of conditions which we have to take into account. We, have, we must move immediately to shut down everything that Bernanke and the pres current president of the United States represent. There's no redeemable quality in either place. We must strip ourselves of obligations for to we should never have undertaken by going back to Glass-Steagall. But we must supplement Glass-Steagall with other measures, such as the creation of a credit system and also the development of, of public credit to projects like NWAPA. And these things will be sufficient to cause a, re a survival of the United States and a movement toward recovery. And because we're going to have to train a lot of people. Remember, many, we have several generations that have really not had the opportunity of experiencing the glories of, of, of progress. So therefore, we need that. And that's, that's the way we have to look at it. We, you cannot simply back, say there, don't, 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 don't. You have to do more. You have to say what you're going to do that will put the United States back in the direction of recovery. 
And we've reached the point that without that program, there's no chance the United States can survive. So therefore, our obligation goes accordingly. Now, since we have you here, uh, we, we are going to have to keep you for a few more a few more questions that we'd like to fire your way. And I, I just want to follow up on the Glass-Steagall because uh, what, what our organization has been doing has, uh, has given us certain, certain knowledge that where we have a pulse on, uh, on leaders of the United States in economy, in government. So you have, you have uh, an, a certain insight into where the progress on Glass-Steagall is going. And you've stated at the opening of this webcast where the the potential breaks on the Obama front, but I think that uh, what the uh, the individuals from institutions who wanted to know your reading, where do you see the tide going? Because we had the statements from uh, from the uh, FDIC uh, vice chair Thomas Honig. We had the statement, the proposal from the current Dallas Fed president. Uh, Fisher on on a bank separation and we've had the uh, alignment of the Tea Party and the uh, more liberal move on crowd the alignment of them on the policy of Glass-Steagall so there is this wave of support but where do you where do you see it going it, because you've you've just You've just stated what must happen, mm -hmm. but would you give your assessment of what you see currently happening? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say what's currently happening, but I say what can be currently happening. There's a difference. We are at a point where we're not, we're not, we no longer think in terms of trends as such. In other words, the question is not whether there's a trend in a possible direction or not. There's a question as to whether there's the will to force the creation of a new trend. And that's our only hope. We have to force the change in direction from the present trend to an entirely reversed trend. And that's the only way this nation will survive. Now, that depends upon moving the intention of the emotions of the American people away from what they believe now to what they believe is possible. Now, this depends upon something which has to be understood, and it's in the nature of the history of humanity. As, we, as far as we know that history, we have intimations of things, you know, like we had things that were going on in the Me area of Mexico, for example, in ancient times, which are far better than they were in late, <laughs> even in modern times, generally. We have f reversals of trends. Mexico, for example, under a former president who was a personal friend of mine, had taken me adopted measures and was instituting measures which the United States and Britain crushed. And the entire destruction of Mexico, which has been going on since then, is a result of the crushing of my friend, that Mexico, Mexico president, who had guts. We had also people in, in Argentina who have guts and had guts, and they were crushed too. We had possibilities in Brazil of improvements in the Brazilian problem, and that was crushed in effect. Not crushed openly, but crushed in effect in terms of the economic effects of what was going on there. So we often is the case that you don't get, tre it's not trends which bring you better news. Often the tr you, when you get better news it's because you reverse the trend. And to now, the question is, are we willing to reverse the trend? And that means, is the federal government going to recognize this problem? And is the federal government going to take actions under law which cause the reversal of those trends? In other words, we're under a trend now which, if continued, will destroy the people of the United States, essentially. Have we got the guts to take the measures which reverse that trend? And that's the crucial thing. See, most people don't understand. The problem here is, is really a scientific one. Most people do not know 
what humanity is. They have ideas of an experience which they call humanity. But most people do not understand that, don't understand it at all. And that's, that's where the shortfalls come. It comes when, in a great crisis, it comes by a sudden reversal of trends. It does not mean a sudden return to glory. It means reversing a bad trend by moving upward. And that's where we have to go now. We have to promote the things as Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt did. See, Franklin Roosevelt was a real hero in this respect, because not only because of what he did, but because of the, of the precedent he set. What he did is he took the United States that was about to be chopped to pieces, it was about to come under a fascist rule like that of Hitler. And it was an attempted coup against Franklin Roosevelt, President Franklin Roosevelt, under these circumstances. And Roosevelt found allies who crushed the would-be crushers. And that was part of the whole program, which saved the United States. Otherwise, the United States would have gone quickly into the same trend as Adolf Hitler. And Franklin Roosevelt's actions prevented that from occurring. And so similarly now, our job and the job of the president, or the future president, shall we say, is to immediately do the same thing, to take all those laws and trends and tendencies and opinions which have moved us in the direction of self-destruction and say, we are a sovereign people who have the, we have the power of reason. And the power of reason may show us that we have to adopt certain resolutions which completely reverse the present trend. And we must do that because we are about losing our population. We've gone through several generations since I came out of military service. And during those periods, and after the assassination of uh, President Kennedy, the United States has gone consistently in the direction of self-destruction. The time has come to reverse that tendency by understanding what that effect on Kennedy was, what that meant, the killing of Kennedy, what that meant. And it was the cover-up of the, assass the, the real cause of the assassination of John F. Kennedy, which sent us into a long war and from there to, into hell itself for most of our people. We're going to have to reverse that. And that's the thing that counts. Do you have the guts not to try to find a way of riding a trend, like riding some kind of fish, big fish on the, in the ocean, but riding, reversing the trend rather than trying to ride one? And that's, the, that's what has to be considered. All right. Well, <clears throat> there's just a lot of things coming in. You don't mind taking two more, do you? No. Okay. Well, uh, first one then on a, on a military aspect of things regarding the conflicts that are spreading in Africa right now. But first, back to the, uh, you know, you were discussing the impeachable acts of Obama, including the, um, including, you know, the War Powers, violation of the War Powers Act. Now, just uh, sometimes he's defending this from the standpoint of, oh, I didn't put any troops, you know, directly at risk, therefore I didn't violate this aspect of the Constitution. As though, you know, if, when you look at the powers of the Senate, as in that uh, part that I had read earlier, you know, including the, uh, including the declaration of war by the Congress, this isn't just about putting troops in harm's way, it's like treaties, it's a part of foreign policy. Even if you're not making American troops possibly in danger of losing their lives, you're still using violence as a means of, uh, as politics, and that requires the Congress in our country. Interestingly, the War Powers Act of 1973, you'd mentioned Nixon, he vetoed it, and that was overridden by the House and the Senate to, to be made into law. I want to ask you about what's going on in Mali and other places right now. I mean, as you've... Uh, pointed out Obama had effectively allied with al-Qaeda in Libya, uh, what we've then been seeing in Syria, where an opposition movement that maybe at first had some potential to go somewhere as just an honest, uh, you know, popular uprising, has now become increasingly dominated, if it wasn't from the beginning, by Islamist forces, al-Qaeda forces, you know, people remember the people saying we're all al-Nusra. Then we've had the... Uh, the attacks in Algeria, the hostage takings. We've got the, what's going on in Mali now, where France is, you know, is is intervening uh, to help clean up some of this. 
And uh, Russia had made an interesting point that said, okay, well, it's, you know, what you're doing in Mali, it sounds good to take care of terrorists, but, you know, that's who you're supporting in Syria, don't you? <laughs> so I wanted to get your thoughts on the, is this just something that's unintentionally spreading out of control? Is there something more sinister at work here? And how is this conflict being uh, used on purpose? Okay. Well, this goes into a, a longer and deeper question. The question of the British Empire. Now, contrary to su popular sus uh, sus suspicions, uh, the British Empire is not the I empire of the British Isles. It is a world empire and became established as a world empire through a war. And this war, which defeated France and other countries, established an empire. And the key empire it established was that over India. So that even before the British Empire had taken over the, the England as such, Great Britain as such, the, the empire had already established itself in places such as North America, uh, Canada, for example, and in terms of India and other locations and throughout Africa. So, and to, to the present day, the majority control in Africa is by the British Empire. The, uh, while the Indian government itself resists to a great degree the degree of control which the British Empire had over its then, it still has an indirect influence over India. It has a very strong influence over Pakistan. It has a strong influence throughout out Asia and so forth. So that we have really, uh, we have Mexico is controlled by the British, by the British drug runners right now. There's al it's almost unsafe to live in Mexico because of the British drug runners, which also include, of course, the uh, Obama administration, which is one of the biggest drug runners in the whole operation, is a part of it. You know? That's what that Fast and Furious was all about. So, and you have also in South America, you have British influence. The United States has been controlled by British financial influences since Andrew Jackson. And while that was set back a bit by Lincoln, President Lincoln and others, nonetheless, in the course of the 20th century, the British influence has controlled, had a lion's share of, our, of control over the United States in terms of U.S. finances. Morgan, for example, what does the think House of Morgan is? The House of Morgan is nothing but a branch of the British Empire. And most of these Wall Street crowd, it's nothing but the British Empire, which controls most of Europe, as well as the United States, in that respect. What do you think this operation is that we're fighting against now for freeing the United States of this gambling money? What, what do you think Bernanke is, but an agent of the British influence? He's printing money for nothing, bankrupting the United States with debts, which the United States really does not owe, but this crooked business. So therefore, we have to understand that we are faced with a British domination of the planet since the, the, the Brit victory of the British in establishing its empire. That empire still exists. It's not an empire of the, of the people of the United Kingdom, though people of that, of that kingdom are included. The Queen herself, of course, is the epitome of that particular relationship. But that does not mean that the British citizens or, or subjects actually are benefiting from this process. Most of them are in terrible condition. Their living conditions are not good. Their opportunities are not good. They've been crushed as much as anybody else. At Britain, at one point, had a, a greater role as an industrial power by far than its economy represents today. So these, and what's happening now under British influence, as in the control of the United States by a whole series of presidents who also were more British than they were anything else in terms of money factors, or Wall Street, or, or Boston, the Boston bankers, or British agents, the New York bankers, largely British agents. The whole system is one of British agents. 
So the thing we have to do is recognize that our country has, our nation has been betrayed in this way and in other ways. And that we have a, the nations of Europe are victims of the British Empire. What do you think the Euro system is? You have a whole group of nations. They were individually sovereign nations. But all of the nations of, of this region no longer have sovereignty. They're controlled by the Euro system. And this is killing them. It's killing literally the people of Greece. It's killing the people of Spain. It's killing the people of Portugal. It's starving people through. Italy is about to go under the same kind of garbage unless it resists it. So this is, the problem is this problem. We are still dominated by a system which has an imperialist basis. It's a, the basis is the same basis that was established in the Roman Empire. It was extended after Rome collapsed, we had a new empire. Then after that empire collapsed, we had the first Venetian Empire. And then after that, we had the new Venetian Empire, which was started as the British Empire. So you have a, a continuity of, of imperialism over this extended period of history. And it's that imperialism which guys, you know, adapts itself to different disguises and different kinds of pretensions and appearances and so forth. This is the problem. What we must understand is we must end this system of empire. Not to for one world nonsense. One world is nonsense. Because the basis, the basis of society is people have their own cultures. The cultures may converge in terms of things they do and laws they adopt and so forth. But the important thing, since the people of these, this empire, so-called, have their own culture, their own language culture, their own history, that the way to run the world is to have a, a confederation of sovereign, respectively sovereign nation states and to bring the whole system into a system of governance in accord with the famous Westphalian Treaty. Go back to the Westphalian Treaty. When the, now you have the British situation and the policy of this current president of ours are both British. The, the president of the United States is nothing but a stooge for the British Queen. And that's a hard fact. Thanks. All right, so here's the, here's the last question for you. Um, the Greenies' view is that the past was better. That moving forward is only done in a good way if you're actually moving backwards. There's also this idea now that progress actually makes people unhappy. Maybe if the idea of progress is McDonald's and suburbia and alienation, etc., so people say, well, let's just, things used to be better. Things used to be better. I want to ask you to comment on the, uh, the conclusion of your paper you just wrote today, An End to Reductionism. You wrote that the human species has the inherent right to defend itself by any required means necessary to defend mankind from any intrusion on its unique right to defend its position against threats presented against it. The right of unbounded expansion of the power of the human species must be recognized as a natural law inherent in the unique nature of our human species. Could you say more? Yes, yes, I could give you a very specific example which will make it simpler that way. We are now faced with a growing threat to life on Earth. Hmm? It's, uh, it's increasing, it's been nasty, but what do you, what do you expect? that in the course of the universe, you imagine that the universe is of fixed characteristics? Do you not um, understand that the universe is changing, that it, the solar system for, in particular has always been changing? It has never had been in an unchanging ma manner. The, the manner is also directed. That is, it's imp impulsively, inherently projected. That's been its history. Now we come to a period in which it is estimated by the relevant people, the scientists, that we're now going into a period of increased risk. And this has been understood since especially the 1970s. A period of increased risk from various you know, 
objectives, objects floating around inside the solar system and beyond. Hmm? So therefore, we now have a problem that if we're going to maintain humanity on life and not have some very, uh, some barrage of objects uh, battering us and probably causing in some cases the, probably the, the cessation of human life on Earth. We're in that kind of a period. Exactly how it's going to work out, why, why and so forth, that's not certain. But it is now a problem. Therefore, in order, the defense of Earth against these kinds of problems, these threats, is a crucial factor for all mankind. Now, it is possible, feasible, in conception, to organize defense of Earth in such a way that we might be able to secure life within the solar system or large parts of the solar system, but effectively in that effect on Earth. Now, th this will mean, undoubtedly, that we're going to have to have capabilities based on Earth, on Mars, but under the direction of us on Earth. Just as we've sent a few things to Mars, a few objects and processes to Mars, we're going to have to put more up there because we have a very poor ability to control the threats from meteorites and whatnot and asteroids huh? from, from within the solar system and beyond. Huh? So therefore, it's necessary for us to take steps to build up a defense. Some of this defense will have to be based on, on objects, functioning objects on Mars itself. I don't think we can say at this point we're ready to put human beings as colonists on Mars. But we can put devices as colonists on Mars, as human represented or controlled devices on Mars, and these devices can be very useful, even, even indispensable, in our ability to try to control all these asteroids running around loose in that space. So therefore, the question, mankind therefore must see itself is a, a factor in the solar system. We're not just managing ourselves on Earth. We have to defend ourselves against the known th types of threats which threaten mankind from within the solar system itself. And the obvious place to put our foot is, first of all, directly on the moon. If you want to control the processes we have to control on behalf of respect to Mars, we've got to do it on the moon first. We've got to get our tunnels on the moon going. It means we're going to have to go to thermonuclear fusion as a power right. You, you could make a trip from the moon to Mars in probably 30 days or less. Hmm? So th these are the kinds of things that we have to think about and begin to do if we're going to protect the possibility of a continuation of human life on Earth. And therefore, we, this, this is normal for us. It's normal for us as human beings. Our direction whenever we're civilized is to increase the power of humanity to manage and defend itself and to develop itself and its powers and prowesses. Hmm? That doesn't mean we're going to go to Mars right away. I don't recommend any of my friends going to Mars right now unless, except on an emergency visit. But we can put things on Mars which are operating functions like Curiosity but are on a much larger scale than Curiosity with more advanced purposes. We can begin to explore this area between Mars and Earth, for example, and explore that and do something about the problems. We may we'll plant things on, just like Curiosity, we'll plant things on large asteroids and things like that and we'll start to map this process and find to get some kind of control over the whole thing. And this is the direction which we have been in, in doing uh, since the end of the 1970s. And there's no reason it should not be continued and accelerated now. In fact, it probably is necessary. It probably is indispensable. But we cannot accept the fact that there's the idea that there may be no risk. If there's a possibility of risk, we must act. We must act on behalf of humanity. And that's the way to look at it. Once we, if we accept that responsibility, that man, mankind on Earth must take control of threats to mankind on Earth within the immediate areas of the solar system. Except that. That gives us a motivation, a direction in policy making, which is appropriate to our desire for a continuity 
of the existence of humanity. And that's the way to look at things. That's, that's the, if you take that, adopt that standpoint, then you're on the right track in thinking. Don't worry about the exact details about the progress. If you're doing that, you're doing the right thing. And mankind has often acted that way. Mankind has often acted on the basis of knowing we should be doing the right thing. And we should not be not doing the right thing. And that's where we should send. Well, that brings this broadcast to a close. I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight and invite you to stay tuned to the LaRouche PAC site and also to join us in this fight and become a member of the LaRouche Political Action Committee. You can do that via the site or also through your uh, local organizer. Again, thank you very much and good night.